All right, guys, let's talk a little bit about thermistors. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm going to have a, a link down below for the PDF for this PowerPoint. All of the, the different links that I'm providing will be, will be there. So each of these right here should be live links. So you can go to each of these different references. There are so many great references on the web. Uh, there's no need for me to reinvent the wheel. Um, two of the, the best resources that I've found so far are these two right here. So Sensor Scientific Inc. They have a great link right here. So if you click on this picture right here, it'll bring you right to their blog. And from Amatherm as well. So two uh, thermistor manufacturers that have probably the best um, write-ups on thermistors that I've seen on the net. So Sensor Scientific Inc. and Amatherm, and you just click on each of these links and you'll be able to get to each of their blogs there. There are a number of different YouTube videos that are much better than uh, mine. So uh, I'll link these two as well. So if you click on this picture right here, it will bring you to uh, this one from Rimstar Org, Thermistor for Measuring and Controlling Temperature. He's got a great video here. And then Chris Kasper, Kasperzak, sorry if I mispronounced the name, uh, has a great video here on using the thermistor, thermistor with uh, the Arduino. So you click on these two bad boys and you can watch some uh, some great videos and they give you a really good background on the thermistor. I'll try to fill in as much as I can from as much as I've learned over the past little while. So what is a thermistor? A thermistor is a thermally sensitive resistor. So all it is a, is a resistor which maintains exact and predictable changes in electrical resistance in response to consistent changes in temperature. So what you what you really need is you need to have something that has a characteristic response for specific changes in temperature. And that's what a thermistor is. It's just a variable resistor, but the resistance changes are totally predictable. And it doesn't matter which manufacturer you go with. If you have a 10K thermistor, it will follow the exact same um, chart as the other manufacturer. So it's great because it's a it's a cheap and easy uh, sensor that you can use to get really crude or really precise values in temperature. There are two different types of uh, thermistors. Uh, I'm going to center in today on well in this video on the NTCs, the negative temperature coefficient. Uh, those are the ones that are most used in industry, uh, and they'll be the ones that are used for temperature sensors. But there are also PTCs or positive temperature coefficients, and, but those are mainly used for current limiting situations. And I think I'll do a different video on those following this one. So we're going to center in on the NTC, the negative temperature coefficient. So what does that mean by negative temperature coefficient? Well, it means that as the temperature goes up, then the resistance of this thermistor or this variable resistor is going to go down. And so you can see that as the temperature increases here, from 10, in this case, all the way to 50 degrees Celsius, uh, then you can see that the resistance is changing. It's not changing linearly either. It's changing exponentially. So as the temperature increases, the resistance is decreasing. The main temperature here, or the reference temperature for each of these charts, is at 25 degrees C. You can see here that this is a typical NTC thermistor, and it's a 10K ohm resistor, uh, thermistor, at 25 degrees Celsius. And if we're looking here, we can see that 25 is matching up with the value of 10 kilohms. Okay, in addition to the, the NTCs, there are PTCs, and obviously with a positive temperature coefficient, then as the temperature goes up, then it's just like any conductor. As the temperature goes up, the resistance is gonna start to go up as well. It's not, it's, it goes up at an exponential rate though. It's much, much greater increase in, in, te, in resistance versus your standard conductor. But we'll get into those afterwards. Uh, history of the thermistor. So you always want to go back and see who invented these, uh, cause there's not enough talk of like who actually put in the time for each of these different sensors. We're using them day in and day out. They're in everything that we use throughout the world. Um, all these guys had all kinds of times on, on their hand. There was no cell phones um, or Reddit or anything or, you know, um, Facebook to keep uh, keep them amused. So they had all kinds of time to delve as deep as they could and, you know, really dive into what each of the, how to create the sensors and the physical dynamics as to how those sensors 
actually work. So we got to give a shout out to the grandfather of electricity, Michael Faraday. Uh, he came up with the concept of thermistors in, back in 1833, uh, said while he was reporting on the semiconductive behavior of silver sulfide. Uh, when he was doing his research, he noticed that the resistance of silver sulfides decreased as the temperature increased. So we'll find that um, a thermistor is more of a, like a semiconductor in that it reacts the same as a silver sulfide in that when the temperature increases, the resistance is going to decrease which is opposite of what you'd normally find in a normal conductor. Okay, so Faraday found that, when was that? Back in 1833, he uh, discovered that. Um, but then it wasn't put into commercial production until the 1930s. Uh, that's when Samuel Rubin invented the first commercial thermistor. Uh, and then since then, technology has improved, paving the road to improve manufacturing processes, along with availability of higher quality materials. Um, so there are a number of manufacturers now um, and the the quality of the thermistors is just mint now. Just another shout out here to uh, Samuel Roman. Um, these guys didn't just go on one topic. I mean, these guys were geniuses. Um, so he also co-founded Duracell. He has a number of different patents under his name as well. So why would I choose to use a, uh, a thermistor? Uh, you'd use a thermistor because it's cheap. It's probably one of the cheapest uh, temperature sensors out there. The temperature range is typically between minus 90 and 130 degrees Celsius. So it's a small window of temperature, but I mean, if you're talking about like in a fridge um, or a freezer or something like that, that would, this would be a great cheap and easy sensor to place in there to look at the temperature. The misters are small in size, which allows for a quick response to your temperature changes. Uh, they can be made to be waterproof. They're pretty much bomb proof. It's really hard to damage them, especially if they're in a glass uh, casing. They work virtually with any control voltage and you can easily be wired to any microcontroller. So you'll see in the videos that I showed you there uh, or linked to with YouTube that you can now use a thermistor and an Arduino and you can get a really good uh, temperature sensor for any application. So where are you gonna use it? Well, it's used as mostly as a temperature sensor. That's primarily what a thermistor would be used for. Uh, you can also use it if you have a PTC for an inrush current limiter, self-resetting over current protector, and a self-regulating heating element. But primarily what we're gonna look at is how it's used as a temperature sensor. What industries do, do they use a thermistor in? Well, I mean, pick an industry and they're gonna make use of a thermistor. Automotive and other transportation, chemical use, uh, HVAC, biomedical sciences, aerospace, military, instrumentation within uh, manufacturing, uh, communications and telecom, uh, and anything that's with commercial or military aviations are going to make use of a thermistor as well. Remember that it's a cheap and light uh, temperature sensor as well. We'll get into like specific applications in a little bit. So what's the difference between a thermistor and an RTD? Because we, as we know, an RTD also changes temperature, um, sorry, resistance with changes in temperature. Uh, but an RTD is basically just a simple coil of wire uh, made of a specific metal. Thermistors are made up of a, a ceramic or uh, a metal polymer. An RTD is great for a larger range of temperature, whereas a thermistor is good for high level precision within a specific range of temp. So if you want something to be really quick and really accurate, you'll go for a thermistor. If you want to have a, a larger range of temperature, then you can go for an RTD. And an RTD uh, stands for resistance temperature detector. So how's a thermistor made? Well, thermistor elements can, are manufactured ma making use of nickel, copper, manganese, iron, cobalt, magnesium, titanium, aluminum, zinc. Um, basically they have uh, metal oxides made of each of those elements or a combination of each of those elements uh, to get certain characteristics and certain temperature ranges out of the thermistor. Uh, they're held together with binding agents and stabilizers and then the metal oxide and ceramic powder is, is pressed at a high pressure and then it's subjected to high temperature sintering and that high temperature sintering creates the semiconductor properties that we're looking for. Lower cost sensors are going to have uh, a coating and epoxy right which gives them that um, waterproof ability. Uh, but if you want it to be in a higher temperature, then you're going to enca encapsulate it, or this is my favorite word, hermetically sealed 
in uh, in glass, right? Because if you're if you got it encased in glass, then the glass is going to absorb all of the the heat. And it's not going to basically vaporize your thermistor once you get up into into the higher temps. Okay, once it's uh, it's created, uh, this is basically what it looks like inside, right? And then you've got your thermistor element. You've got your leads coming off of these guys, and then depending on the, the thermistor, uh, you may have that glass encapsulating the unit. There's all different types of uh, styles out there. So this one right here um, is a thermistor, but it looks like a, uh, a Zener diode. These guys like right here look like capacitors, but in fact they are thermistors. These ones you can drill and tap into um, like a larger piece of metal. So you have like a larger heat sink that you can drill and tap into. And they've got the sensing unit right here. And again, these guys almost look like uh, RTDs, uh, but inside here, it'll have the thermistor body. Again, all different types of, uh, you know, thermistors that are out there for different temperature ranges and different applications as well. Okay, so what's the difference between a thermistor, an RTD, a thermocouple, or basically a semiconductor temperature sensor? Uh, so if you need to, you can, uh, you can stop the video here, right? And if you're answering any of the questions that I provide you guys, then this might be a good place uh, to start. So thermistors, they're saying uh, minus 55 to 125. They'll go a little bit higher than that. Um, typical characteristics. Well, it's an exponential curve, right? It's either dropping that temperature, that resistance in an exponential curve on an NTC or increasing in an exp exponential curve on the PTC. Uh, it has high sensitivity and fast response time. So that's basically why you're looking for it. It has a really high sensitivity and really fast response time. Um, excitation or power? Well, yeah, we're going to create a voltage divider, so we're going to need to have some current flowing through this guy. Um, a 10K thermistor is not going to have that much current, so it's not it's not using a lot of power in order to create that, that signal. Um, let's see. Long-term st stability um, is low. I'm not, I'm not sure why it's low right there. I don't, doesn't, they have, say that it hasn't, uh, I'm looking at this stability like it's going to break down over time. I'm not sure why that is saying that it's low. Self-heating, for sure it's self-heating. It's a resistor. You're putting current through it in order to develop a voltage. Um, so as you put current to it, you're going to have some self-heating. And that might actually affect um, the readings that you're getting off of it. Cost is low. They're dirt cheap. Okay, you can look at each of the, the other resistors here. And you're basically looking at your application and you're, the first thing you're looking at is the temperature range. What temperature range are you looking at? If you're looking at something in a higher range, you're probably going to go for an RTD. If you're looking at like a really high temperature, like you're going to put something right into a flame, well then these guys are probably going to smoke within a, you know, a natural gas flame. So why don't you use a thermocouple there, right? If you're just using a general purpose thermistor for this small range of temperature, uh, a thermistor would be great for that application. Okay, right here, the problem, I'm trying to decide what type of temperature sensor I should use in my application. What are the advantages, disadvantages of using an RTD, a thermocouple, or a thermistor? So again, they'll have different ranges here depending on, um, you know, which product that they're actually looking at. But you can see here that, like, this is really low and at minus 100 degrees Celsius, right? And that's a little bit higher than the average range. Um, but again, you can see that this guy is maximum it's probably like 300 500 is pushing it this one we're up to 649 and this one up we're up to a disgusting 2300 degrees celsius okay down here it says thermistors have a fast output relative relatively inexpensive but are fragile and have uh, a limited range they're not fragile i mean if you beat it with a hammer sure it's fragile but they're pretty resilient uh, they also require a current source and do ex uh, do experience more self-heating than an rtd and are nonlinear. So those are the two drawbacks in that it's a resistor, it's going to have more self-heating than an RTD as the current goes through it, and the output from the thermistor is nonlinear. So if you want a linear output, um, then you're going to have to do some math in order to create that output. Okay, again from uh, Omega, and again on the bottom of each of these slides, 
Um, there are each of the different links here. So from Omega, they've got, uh, again, a good comparison chart for each of your different types of sensors. Okay, how are you gonna test out a, a thermistor? Well, you're going to remove it from the uh, from the circuit. I believe this one is from a fridge. From, I can't remember, I think it's from a fridge. Um, so they obviously come in different uh, housings. Um, this one here, we have the two leads on here. It is again a 10 kilo ohm thermistor. So you're taking it out of the circuit so that you're not reading something else in the circuit. You're keeping your fingers away from it because your fingers are also going to uh, affect the resistance of it as well. And then you're putting your meter leads on it um, in the, you know, ten, in the kilo ohms range there. And there we're seeing 10 kilo ohms. You're going to see 10 kilo ohms at what temperature? Well, at 25 degrees Celsius, you're going to read that 10 kilo ohms. Remember that that is the reference temperature for each of these guys. So if you have a 10 kilo ohm thermistor, it's going to give you 10 kilo ohms at 25 degrees Celsius, right? Basically, room temperature is more down here, right? So at this point, it looks like like a 21 or something. We're going to have something just above 11K for the value, okay? If you're not reading anything, then uh, the thermistor is shorted out somehow. Um, and if you're reading the wrong value, then somehow it's been cooked or, I mean, it's not likely from the manufacturer. Something's happened in the circuit where the thermistor is smoked and you'll just have to replace it. Again, great videos here on how to test out each of your thermistor sensors on each of these links. Okay, the chart that corresponds to that 10K table is right here. And you can see right here that at 25 degrees Celsius, that's where we're getting the 10K. This is an NTC thermistor. So as the temperature increases, so if we go from 25 to 30, we can see that the relative resistance of that unit is going down. So temperature goes up, resistance goes down. Okay. If the temperature goes down, right, from 25 down to 18, well then obviously the resistance is gonna go up. And it goes up and down on that exponential curve. So that exponential curve is seen here. And we can see here that um, the 25 is corresponding to 10. And you can take uh, a number of different readings. So you can heat it up and just take the readings as you heat it up, then put it into uh, a bath of ice water. Put in like a meat thermometer in there so you get a good temperature uh, from another reference there. And then reference the chart and see what value you're actually getting on the thermistor. It okay. doesn't matter whether you're using the PTC or the NTC, uh, you're going to have that exponential curve that happens. Uh, we love to have linear relationships, right? Where you just basically take a reading and that corresponds to the resistance and that resistance corresponds to the temperature. It's a little bit more complicated than that when you get into the exponential curve. So we have the Steinhardt Hart equation, um, which is a great, basically the equation for taking the values that we're seeing in resistance and providing us with the corresponding temperature. Because again, we don't have that linear relationship where you can just go right across and just say, all right, well, that value right there corresponds to that temperature, right? So the Steinhardt Hart equation is going to do that for us. It was developed by uh, John Steinhardt and Stanley R. Hart uh, when they published the work in 1968. Um, and this is, I found this interesting that they created a thermistor and well, they didn't create the thermistor, but they created the equation to extrapolate the data from the thermistor. Um, and from their equation, now we're able to get amazing, amazing temperature readings. Um, and with global warming and everything, it's just interesting that they, back in 1968, uh, they were looking at uh, deep sea research and oceanic te temperatures using the thermistor. That equation looks like this. So from Wikipedia, the Steinhardt equation is a model of the resistance of a semiconductor at different temperatures, right? So the thermistor is basically a semiconductor. When you, when you center it at that temperature, you're getting a semiconductive uh, material. Once you heat it up to a, a certain degree, then the, the resistance goes down. The resistance goes down because the electrons are more, are, can more freely move within that circuit. Okay. I don't understand this equation. This is one of those, um, those instances where I want to learn more about uh, the nature of this unit, but the math gets in the way. So my math is just brutal, 
Um, and so I couldn't tell you anything about this equation. Uh, if you're in a technician uh, program, then hopefully you have a math component as well. Uh, for us as electricians, we have limited time when we're in trade school. Um, and during high school, we never saw the application for the math. So I'm always kicking myself for not keeping track of the, the math and not being stronger on the math side of things. Uh, because in order to learn things, you know, in a more in-depth manner, um, you have to get into the math. And I just don't have those skills. Okay. From what I understand, that equation will basically provide a, a from what I'm, I'm totally wrong. I could be totally wrong. And if I am, then mention it in the comments here. I think the Steinhardt equation basically takes that exponential curve and provides a linear relationship uh, between the, the temperature and the resistance in order to get us those charts that we looked at before. If you have a better understanding of the Steinhardt uh, equation or you have some links so that I can understand a little bit more, then provide them for me in the comments. Okay, so how are we going to con condition that thermistor signal? Um, well, it's just a variable resistance. So there's no need to make it any more complicated than it should be. Right? Even though the resistance temperature characteristic is nonlinear, that nonlinear output is predictable, repeatable, and can be reproduced to exacting specifications, meaning it doesn't matter which manufacturer you're coming from. Um, that chart, that 10K chart, will go for any different manufacturer there. So let's not complicate things. We have you know, a stable, uh, predictable, and repeatable signal that's coming out based on the temperature. Right, giving us a, biz, uh, a specific resistance at each of those temperatures. So well, let's make use of it. And if we have a varying resistance, well, let's just have a, a reference resistor and let's create a voltage divider. And as that resistance, one resistor changes in the circuit, then we'll get a voltage out. So there's two different ways that we can um, make use of this resistor. We can either use a voltage divider or we'll make use of a Wheatstone bridge. The voltage output from there is going to connect into our analog, the digital converter on our microcontroller. And then either that signal or through some coding, we'll be able to extrapolate the, uh, the temperature. The most important thing is not the conditioning. It's just making sure that you have the appropriate temperature sensing range, that you've got the accuracy from the manufacturer that you're looking for, and the resolution. So working with the manufacturers to determine which thermistor is best suited to your application is the most important thing. The actual conditioning um, is dead simple compared to that. So in, uh, in my video here, or in a number of other videos, all you have to do is just take the 10 kilo ohm thermistor and put it with a reference resistance. So in this case, I'm doing it at room temperature. Um, so I'm gonna take the same resistance here. If there's no difference in these values right here, then in this case, this 3.3 volts is going to be dropped across here and here equally. If these two voltage values are exactly the same, well, then the voltage coming out of this voltage divider is going to be zero. There'll be no difference between those two voltages. As this thermistor starts to change, and it changes in an exponential way, um, then the ratio of these two resistances are going to change with that. So the ratio will change in an exponential curve as well. And as the ratio of these two resistances change, we're going to get a voltage out anywhere between, in this case, 0 to 3.3 volts. Uh, if you're wondering why I have 3.3 volts rather than 5 volts, I found that the, on the Arduino, the 3.3 source was more stable than the 5 volt source. But normally in industry or um, like if you're working on your car and you're looking at the thermistor and it's going to the, the computer on your car, it's going to be using a 5 volt source. So it's a dead simple way to get um, a varying voltage from a varying resistance. Okay, so let's finish off with a number of applications for the thermistor. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it yet, but this is your standard symbol for a thermistor. right? Similar to a variable resistor, it has the line through it. Uh, here we can see that this is for an NTC, showing that it has a negative temperature coefficient. Uh, if it was a PTC, then we'd just have a plus right here. So applications for your uh, thermistor. Basically, anything in your house or any appliance in your house is going to make use of a thermistor, right? Your coffee machine, your microwave, um, your kettle, your stove, your refrigerator, all of these guys 
are making use of thermistors in order to get an accurate temperature reading. Uh, your printer as well, right? And on your home printer or your one in your office as well, all of those guys are going to be making use of the thermistor in order to take temperature readings on a number of different places within the machine. So your microwave oven, there's a number of different things. It has a humidity sensor uh, embedded in, in there, but it's also looking at uh, the temperature within the chamber and around the magnetron as well in order to keep track of the temperature. And if you have an over an over temperature situation, then your microwave will shut off. So microwaves have a, a thermistor in there. Obviously there's different types of uh, housings in there, but for sure, for sure, they're gonna have a thermistor in there. It could just be something like this. So you can see that this diagram right here has these two uh, mountings. And then on this video here with the Whirlpool microwave, uh, that is the actual thermistor. And then it has the two leads that go onto the circuit board. Again, any of the links here, these are great videos to watch um, if you're like me and you like watching thermistor videos. Uh, but any of the links will be uh, below if you want to check them out. Okay, uh, your front end lo front load washer is also going to make use of a thermistor. So your washer, your dryer, each of those guys has to keep track of the, the temperature within the appliance. Uh, so they will make use of the thermistor because it's a cheap and accurate and quick way in order to take that temperature reading. The two wires go into the circuit board and then through the, the diagnostics there, it's able to sequence through the different portions of your load. Okay, your fridge is also going to make use of a, a number of thermistors, right, in different housings as well. These are great videos here on how to replace uh, the thermistor. Um, if you are a technician for appliances, you really need to know your, uh, your stuff on each of your different sensors. Uh, if you're a homeowner and the, you know, something's not cycling through on e any of your appliances, you now have the skills to go through uh, and take that sensor out test it out, right? See whether it's the, the actual sensor being the thermistor or whether it's the circuit board. And each of these videos will walk you through how to do that. Okay, different thermistors in there, right? With different housings. Here you can see that the thermistor is uh, mounted right here on the defrost. And so it keeps track of the temperature of whatever's in that pipe there. It could be on the, the cooling fins. Right, so here you can see that the ther thermistor is mounted with the use of a mounting clip. And again, the two leads here go into your circuit board. Okay, in order to test that guy out, like we said, um, you can go to this link and follow, th follow the instructions that they're providing. But essentially what they're doing is they're saying, all right, take the thermistor out of the circuit, eliminate it from the circuit, then to put your meter onto the ohmic setting, Right? So you can see here that they have it on the ohmic setting and test out. You can see that uh, underneath the, the fridge, they'll probably have the, the part sheet. And there it will tell you uh, most likely that it's a 10K resistor or whatever uh, thermistor that you're looking at. And you'll be able to see that at room temperature, what value you're actually looking for. So again, this is a 10K uh, thermistor being seen at room temperature. Okay. On the freezer, you can see that here we're looking at two different thermistors. There's one right here and one right here. So different housings, different mountings uh, will be used. But again, it's essentially the same thing. In, these, in this case, it's an NTC. So as the temperature starts to, to, to decrease, then the resistance is going to increase. Okay, Lots of different housings for each of these thermistors. In this case, this is a, a freezer thermistor. You may end up uh, having a thermistor within your thermostat. Uh, it's not likely that we're going to be troubleshooting that, um, but you need a small, a small sensor in order to look at your ambient temperature in the house. Most likely, it's going to be a thermistor that's mounted somewhere on that circuit board. In your car, you've got thermistors to keep track of uh, a number of different things. Uh, you've got air intakes, exhaust gas, you're looking at all of your, uh, your fluid levels and temperatures there as well. So the thermistor will be key. anything that that's going to keep track of the temperature on any of the, the components of your car is most likely going to be a thermistor as well.
So they'll use a five volt source there. And again, just basically through using a voltage divider, they'll provide a zero to five volt output to correspond to that temperature. Okay, so in there, they're gonna be making use of, in this case, they're looking at water or oil temperature, right? And then they've got air intake sensors as well to look at the temperature on your air coming in and your exhaust air going out. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a car or a motorcycle, they're, mo they're most likely gonna make use of thermistors. Battery chargers also make use of thermistors. And it was, as we've seen with the, uh, the Samsung videos, uh, they, if one of these guys overheats, then they're very explosive. So we need something in the circuit there in order to keep track of the temperature of the actual battery pack. The temperature of the battery pack is going to determine, uh, the charging rate as well. So the thermistor will be used as well within, uh, the circuitry in order to determine, um, whether to charge it faster or slower. And it's all based off of the temperature they're getting off of the thermistor that's basically mounted right on top of your battery pack. So they're used everywhere, guys. Here they've, uh, this is someone who set up a, a wireless node here. It's going off of a, a lithium battery. And so they're keeping track of the temperature of the lithium battery. And you can see that the thermistor right here is mounted onto their circuit board so that they can keep track of the temperature as well. Okay. There may be a, a third wire there, so you may have your positive and your negative, and they'll also make use of the thermistor, again, for that charging cycle for these batteries. If you've got a laptop, then mounted right beside the battery is also a thermistor, so they're, they're everywhere, right? Take apart any different appliance or anything that you have in your house, and it'll make use of a thermistor somewhere in there. Right. In this case, they're looking at uh, just overheating of the of the batteries there within the actual laptop. Okay. If you take apart your old Makita uh, drill, then again, it's got a number of batteries there. It's rechargeable batteries, and within there, it's got a thermistor that's integral to the circuit. Okay. In this case, they're talking about the NTC being used. Uh, with that battery pack, uh, it says the t temperature monitoring function is enabled by connecting a 10 kilo ohm, uh, NTC thermistor from NTC to ground. Um, and it says the NTC pin sources, uh, 50 microamps, right? So there's very little current that's actually used in these circuits and monitors the voltage dropped across the 10 K thermistor. When the voltage on the pin is above this value or below this value, the battery temperature is out of range. And it triggers a fault. So you can just, you can easily get your faults to come into your circuit board just by looking at a voltage that's coming off of that voltage divider circuit that we talked about earlier. Okay, if you've got a PC cooling fan, it'll also make use of a thermistor, right? So that the thermistor will be essentially turning it on and turning it off, right? Or controlling inrush current to the fan. Other ones for uh, PC cooling, you can see here that there's a heat sink right here. Mounted on top of the heat sink is the thermistor, and that's going to allow more or less cooling based of the, off of the signal or the voltage that it's getting off of those two wires coming off of your thermistor. Okay, you can easily get uh, temperature measurements. Uh, and what's so cool about uh, things like the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino now is that they now have... Um, circuit boards now where you can basically connect up in this case your thermistor and get a usb output to your microcontroller so you can get live readings of temperature readings here just by connecting up your thermistor here and then you'll get your usb output thermistors come in all those different uh housings they also are integral to uh like your phone or small uh like very, very small components. And when you're doing that, the thermistor basically looks like any of the chips that are on there, right? So by, by changing the, the substrates that are in here, they'll be able to change the, the values for the thermistor. And then they'll be able to take readings, uh, either external in this case to the phone or 
in this case, they're looking at the, the temperature of the CPU as well, right? So you can easily get values within the, the chip or external. And again, they're keeping track of the temperature of the battery pack as well. I'm not sure whether they're used on the new Nest thermostats. Um, just not sure. They, they may be using thermistors. They may be using another type of solid state uh, temperature detector on there. Uh, I just grabbed as many examples as I could. So compact fluorescent lamps, uh, the driver for that guy makes use of uh, an NTC thermistor, which is L, so this guy right here. And it's also got a PTC thermistor as well, I guess for inrush currents right here. So they make use of both the NTC and the PTC on the circuit board. If you're getting into 3D printing, uh, then your heated bed, you've got to keep track of the temperature on that as well. If you're into 3D printing, um, I would highly recommend Thomas San... I can't even say his last name. San Lauditor. Um, he's got awesome videos on uh, on 3D printing. This one here is um, walking you through how to, to drill into your heated bed and mount the thermistor properly in order to get accurate temperature measurements off of it. You're also going to make use of the thermistor uh, in your cartridge gun as well, right? So they've got to keep track of the temperature. So there'll be a thermistor that's mounted right here to give live readings into your circuit board for your 3D printer. Okay, anything as simple as like a digital thermometer that you're using. The digital thermometer may make use of an RTD or it's going to make use of a thermistor. Within that digital thermometer, if you rip it apart, you can see that we have the thermowell, protective sheathing here, and then right here, there's our thermistor that's mounted to give us live readings of whatever temperature we're getting off of here. You're also going to find thermistors uh, in certain fire alarm units as well. Right? So certain heat detectors will make use of the thermistor within their circuitry. They're everywhere, guys. Rip apart anything, you're probably going to find a thermistor. Okay, if you want to keep track of uh, ovens, so you're getting into commercial ovens, uh, you can put either an RTD or more likely a thermistor in there, right? That thermistor is now going to connect into your circuit board and that's going to give you live readings of your temperature within the oven. Okay, giving a shout out to the Steiner Hart uh, equation with those guys as ocean oceanographers keeping track and getting really accurate readings on the temperature of the ocean as well uh, will make use of a thermistor, right? So here they've got uh, this temperature sensor that they throw into the ocean or into the sea to try and keep track of uh, those changing temperatures with the currents and they're making use of that thermistor, giving them really accurate temperature readings. Okay, still going. There, I mean, you pick any field and you'll find a thermistor. So number of different applications in the medical field as well. If you have an incubator for, uh, for children, uh, you've got to keep track of the temperature in there and they'll make use of a thermistor. If you've got a pulmonary catheter, then you can see here uh, that it's got a thermistor that's embedded with the balloon. So they're keeping track of the actual uh, temperature within your body. So it's a non-intrusive, uh, I mean, it's intrusive in that they're, they're placing it in there, right? Um, but it's a stable unit, right, that's hermetically sealed and, and can be placed right into the body to give you temperature readings inside of your certain organs. Okay, in the, the heating and ventilation area, they're going to be used as well. And here you can see that uh, they're looking at the temperature of the water going in and out. Right, so they have a, a thermistor that's mounted on there to give them live readings, and those two wires are again tied into the circuit board. Okay, whether you're looking at uh, the temperature within a duct or the temperature on a, a cooling coil right here, it doesn't matter. Either of those, a thermistor is a great uh, temperature sensor for each of those different applications. Okay, maybe you're looking at uh, the the shunt temperature here. Right, so here they're keeping track of the current that's flowing on the on the actual conductor here, right? And they're make use making use of a number of different uh, shunt temperature sensing thermistors that's keeping track of the temperature of the bus 
as the current actually flows. And as we get more and more into uh, space and Elon Musk and his buddies start uh, getting into mining of asteroids and everything uh, and gathering data from Mars, we're also going to be using um, really accurate temperature detectors uh, that are robust. And so on any of the, the landers now, they'll probably be making use of a thermistor in order to take those temperature readings as well. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Hopefully that gave you a good uh, brief synopsis of what an NTC thermistor is and applications for them. Uh, if you like this video, then add some comments uh, below. If you think I've missed something, then add that below as well, or if any of the links are down, uh, make a comment in the comment section and I will change the PDF. If you're looking for the PDF of this PowerPoint, again, go to the link in the comment section and you can follow along with me. All right, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.